weights. I think I, I, think I had too much. Um, who here has a greenhouse? Who here has a greenhouse? Okay. Can you say something about your greenhouse? It's terrible. It's terrible. Why is it terrible? Well, in my case, because the roof panels blow off. The roof panels, they blow off? Um, what type of greenhouse? A hoof house or a glass greenhouse? Or? It's a um, polystyrene, Okay. A plastic type. Polycarbonate. Polycarbonate. <coughs> okay. Does it uh, does it work in the middle of winter or is it you have to no. shut it down for the winter? No. Yeah. Who else has a greenhouse? I want to say a little bit about your greenhouse. Yeah, I saw you raise your hand. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your greenhouse. Well, actually, I actually have two. You have two greenhouses. I have a hoop house and then a regular greenhouse. Polycarbonate. What are you using for? Uh, starting plants. And okay. I actually do grow some early vegetables in the hoop house. Okay. Anybody else got a greenhouse? <laughs> no one's been <laughs> <No one's been laughs> What kind of greenhouse do you have? It's a hoop house. You got a hoop house? Okay. Single single um layer or two layers? Okay, cool. Embarrassed <laughs> everybody. That's not a good thing to do as a percent. <laughs> so I'm Jeremiah. I run a business called Frosty Fish Aquaponics. Um, we build aquaponics that are meant to be grown in our kind of climate. Um, and over the last few years of doing aquaponics, I've gotten to see a lot of people using all kind of greenhouses, and I've learned a lot. Um, I'm also an energy efficiency engineer, so I know a little bit about um, using energy in a climate like ours. Um, and this presentation is almost entirely pictures. And so what I'm hoping will happen is these pictures will make you think about something, right? And you'll want to ask a question, or you want to make a comment. Um, you know, if I stand up here and talk the whole time, I'm going to get bored. I don't know about you guys. Uh, but it would be a lot more interesting for me, and I'm hoping a lot more interesting for you, if we can have a little bit of dialogue here. Um, so I'm sorry for putting people on the spot, but I really would love to hear if you got a little corner of your yard that you think you might be able to put a greenhouse on, but you got a question. There's a reason you think it might not work. Or if you've got a greenhouse and you're wondering what it would take, or if you've got a bunch of stuff in your garage, if you want to know if you can build a greenhouse out of it. Like, I'd love to talk with you about that. Um, so if anything piques your attention, just feel free to ask me questions. Does anybody have any questions right off the bat? Yeah. yeah. So I, I wouldn't pull a hand that we used to have when we tried one of the smaller ones, and I weighed it down everything in the wind, and it rips it all apart, and it's gone within one year. So. That's frustrating. So, like, to try something more like it was a little, you know, thing that you get from the canaries and whatever. Yeah. Did you have anything uh, uh, connected to your hoop house that was specifically to protect it, protect it for wind? No. What was it made out of? With sand, sandbags around the base to hold it down. So what happened is that the wind caught underneath the plastic and then pulled the whole thing apart? Yeah. And yeah. Then also wow. Um, so one thing that people often use to protect against severe winds in areas where there's a lot of wind, like there's quite a few people that grow on the main coast, a very windy place, um, but it's a little bit protected from the temperatures because you got that sea right there. And there's a product called um, wiggle wire. So there's these channels you can install in your greenhouse, and there's this metal wire that you just wiggle back and forth in there, and it holds your plastic on there without putting a lot of pressure on any piece, so it's not going to rip, but it holds it very sturdy. And so it's not going to pull out. So if your problem is catching the plastic from underneath and ripping it out, wiggle wire is probably your solution. Yeah. What do you mean by passive solar greenhouse? Well, that's a good question. Actually, my first couple slides are about that. I'm going to figure out how to make this mouse in OK, passive solar greenhouse. Basically, when it's cold outside and you want it to be warm inside, you can grow all your plants in the middle of the winter. Without using any energy at all, so this is a fancy gutter connected big greenhouse in the Netherlands that's growing with a radiant heating system. That's a pretty efficient way to heat a greenhouse, but it still takes an incredible amount of energy. Um, if you want to be able to do that, to grow all winter without any heat at all, then what you need is a passive solar greenhouse. Now, passive solar greenhouses came out of something called the passive house movement. It was sort of the passive house movement. Yeah. Can you tell me what the passive house movement is? Super insulated, um, thick walls without a lot of um, thermal bridging, which means you have gaps between anything that goes from the inside and the outside, like studs. Um, tight, real tight, like submarine tight, really expensive windows, really expensive doors that are well sealed. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. It came out of Germany in the 1970s. Somebody had the idea, I don't know who the founder was, but the idea was to build a house that will not freeze ever. Right? So a passive house is the kind of house that you can build, and, and you build it for your climate. So like if you built it for our climate, it would, it would absorb enough sunlight during the day and store that sunlight in thermal mass, and I'll explain what thermal mass is, <clears throat> in such a way that it doesn't matter how cloudy it is, or how cold it gets, um, that house will not freeze. It will never go below 32 degrees. <clears throat> and so if you've got a house that's never gonna go below 32 degrees, the vast majority of the time you don't have to heat it at all. You only have to heat it on days when it's below zero, and not even on those days you don't have to give much heat. Now it's pretty complicated to do. It's not easy to build a passive house. <clears throat> but once people started figuring out that you could do it, right? You know, we don't want our houses to drop below 65 or 55 or whatever you have at night. But a greenhouse can get down to 32 and most plants are fine. <clears throat> so by borrowing a lot of the passive house concepts that were developed in Germany and applying them to greenhouses, you can build a greenhouse which will never freeze or will never go below whatever temperature you design it to never go below. So it's pretty difficult to make a greenhouse that will never freeze in our climate with no heat. But it's not that hard to make a greenhouse that will never go below 20 degrees. And if you can keep it above 20 always, you can grow lettuce, you can grow spinach, you can grow kale. There's a whole variety of broccoli of things you can grow. If there's no wind and it stays above 20, that's what a passive solar greenhouse is. And so we're going to talk about some of the things that you put in a greenhouse to make it so it can do that. Um, that sound appealing to anybody having a greenhouse that will do that? Yeah? Any questions at this point about anything else? Is there a that includes at night, yeah. That's, 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 that's easy to find right down here, yeah, not at night. Two o'clock in the morning. Is there a specific scale that you need to work with? Nope. You can be, there's a guy named Joel Ostentowski out in Colorado that builds half acre passive solar greenhouses. You can't make them real, so they have, they have to be long and skinny, generally, right? Because you need to have a ratio between the size of your greenhouse and the size of this thermal mass storage, which is generally the back wall. So you can't have a big square greenhouse, you need to have long skinny greenhouses. And in and, and China actually, the Chinese are fantastic at this. They build like entire acres out of long skinny greenhouses, one row after another, with huge amounts of solar thermal energy. And they don't heat them, and they grow tomatoes all winter long in a climate similar to like central Indiana. Chinese are way ahead of us with this. We're catching up. So why do you want to pass this to a greenhouse? A nice place to spend time? Right? Your vitamin E, you get your vitamin E in winter. You know, you got plants growing, you've got your coffee, you can read your newspaper. You know, it's just a nice place to feel like something's still alive in this world when it's January and it's ice everywhere. You can grow plants year round. You can see these plants are a little leggy, right? You know, some of this lettuce is starting to droop over. I don't even know if it's lettuce. These are, these are a little bit leggy. And, and so what happens to your plant, especially things like tomatoes, is they don't grow especially well in winter even if it's warm enough because you don't get enough light. So you generally have to supplement light if you want to grow certain kinds of plants. And it doesn't matter what you do in terms of thermal storage. But you can grow a lot of things year-round. Okay. Plants that don't need a lot of light, like, like certain kinds of lettuce and, um, and certain plants that grow well in the shade, you can grow indoors year-round and they grow just fine. And you don't have to add a lot of supplemental light, just a little bit. That looks like it's attached to the home. Mm -hmm. Could you do the same thing freestanding or no? You could do the same thing freestanding. Okay. Yeah, yeah. you don't see the back here where it's attached to the house. Um, I, I believe this greenhouse actually has a separation between the house. So there's a door you have to open to get to it. Um, but depending on what you put as the, uh, the surface of your building, that is allowing it to attach to the house. You can use the surface of your house as a thermal storage. <clears throat> and then your greenhouse can stay nice and warm. And one thing you can do, which is kind of cool, is you know, if you have a greenhouse that's going to get real hot, right, over the course of the daytime, you know, if it's like 10 degrees out, but you're getting all this solar energy coming in here, you can vent some of that into your house and warm up your house. And then at night you shut it off. But you've provided some heat to your house doing that too. So there's, there's ways to do that. You'll see an example a little bit later of a greenhouse that you can build 
and take down pretty easily. So yes, you can do it. Um, well, right. So if you just want to, and you just want it for the winter, just for the summer. Well, I guess I'm kind of playing with the idea of thinking like you know, three season porch, but then you can put glass in or something during the winter time, so that you can turn it into kind of a glass. All right. Yeah. But in the summer, it's like protecting you from gnats that you can still be kind of I'm going to guess it would probably be easier just to permanently retrofit. Mm -hmm. So you just install something inside. You, you install the, the type of glazing and enough insulation so that you've got basically your greenhouse that you have now or your porch converted to a passive solar greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And then you just leave it that way because that's not going to hurt you in the summer to have it that way. Unless, it, or do you want it to be completely with no roof, like just a regular porch in the summertime? Well, I guess I'm thinking now that a screened in area would be totally fine. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's ways to do that. You can build an attachment. Um, you know, if you're if you're good with woodworking, you can build little hinges and stuff, so you can pull off. I'll show you some stuff that you can do later on with shutters, where you can shutter up your whole greenhouse, and that'll give you thick insulation. So that whole nighttime thing, right? You can put your shutters up at night, and you'll see how to do that. <laughs> um, every Passive solar, all the passive solar greenhouse designers are in Colorado. I don't know why they do I really don't. I actually have no idea why. Uh, but they all have like pictures of banana trees on their brochures. There's something about these big banana leaves and you know clusters of banana and like snow in the background that's just like inspiring to people. And so yeah, you can grow tropical fruit and vegetables if you've got a greenhouse and every goal is below 32 degrees. So if you really want to grow bananas, <coughs> you can grow bananas. You can, you can go bananas. <laughs> Roman Eddies. That wasn't planned. That was <laughs> uh, you can start plants early. You know what a lot of people use greenhouses for? I like to start my peppers and my basil about now. Right? I start my tomatoes in a couple of weeks, and then when it's time to plant them outside, they're this tall. So I plant half of them underground, and then I get tomatoes in the middle of June, which is fantastic. Um, so if you like to garden outside and you need space, you know, one of the things that's funny about my house, if you were to come to my house in about a month, you wouldn't be able to find any place to sit, right? <laughs> it's like the bed is covered with, you know, flats of plants, and my couches are all flats. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but my whole house is like every space that has any window or any, like, open space is covered with flats of plants because I grow outside. And so if you have a passive slope greenhouse, which I actually don't have in my house, um, then you can move all the way outside and so you can reclaim that living space from your gardening <laughs> Extravaganza. If you like to tinker, um, building a passive solar greenhouse is really kind of fun and interesting thing to do. I see you. Uh, and it gives you a place where when you're bored in the winter because you can't go outside, you can tinker on your projects and you, you try growing all different kinds of plants and you can figure out ways to make it more energy efficient and you can measure temperatures and humidities and play with all that kind of stuff if you're a tinker kind of person. Question? After you get the plant started in the house, do you have to then, like in, say, May, roughly, acclimate them to the cold or the, the conditions outside? Uh, generally, yes, especially with cold weather plants. So if you're starting spinach that you're planning on bringing outside and say, like, as soon as the ground is workable, um, yeah, it's a good idea to bring them outside and let them experience a little bit of wind and a little bit of colder temperatures um, before you actually put them in the ground. So, like, during the daytime, you know, usually two days is enough for me. So for a couple of days, is that me? Something over here. Is that the, the camera? Something's beeping over here. It's my watch, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, it's your watch, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. I thought it was you. Uh, yeah, so what I do with my spinach and my kale and plants that I start early, that I want to start uh, early in the spring when the ground is workable, I take a couple of days when it's moderate temperatures, you know, 35, 40 degrees outside, and I just put them outside. And then when I get home from work, I put it back in the greenhouse. You do that for a couple days, they're generally frost hardened and they're okay to go outside. My question is, why do you bother to start them in the springtime? Why do I bother to start them in the springtime? Like kale and spinach and stuff? Yeah. Because haven't you ever started them in the fall? Do you start spinach in the, the fall and so forth and in, in a cold frame? Yeah. And starting in and maybe give them a little cover of straw later on for a couple warm days in the springtime, open up the cold frame and your spinach will take off and you don't have to worry about 
plugs and so forth. I've done it several years and it works very fine. That's a good starting idea. right in the fall in the cold frame or in the or in the, or in the greenhouse. And the same thing in the greenhouse and the cold greenhouse. And just come springtime and it starts being warm, they just take right off. Yeah, that's a great idea. There's a guy named Elliot Coleman from Maine that has come up with this idea where you just take a piece of uh, half inch PVC tubing and you just stretch it over two rows in your garden and you cover it with uh, one layer of um, that white agarbon, you know, like that white um, row cover stuff, you know, the quality stuff, not the stuff that you get to come keep out bugs, the quality stuff for winter. And then you cover that with a roll of a layer of plastic and you can keep, your, like you said, you can keep, last year with the pull of vortex, you wouldn't have been able to keep anything except for spinach, your kale would have died and stuff, but you could have kept spinach even then. And most years you can keep kale and Swiss chard. <laughs> And something like that. But yeah, that's a great idea. <clears throat> um, so, so in that case, you wouldn't have to worry about hardening anything off, you know, because you're not worrying about starting to grow much. Uh, if you are a person uh, who's concerned about the state of the world and thinks there may be a time when you need to be able to grow some of your own food, having a passive solar greenhouse, which requires no energy and allows you to grow things all year round, is kind of about as good as you can do. <clears throat> Why else? Teach your kids. This is my daughter, Cork, <laughs> in my greenhouse. And I am excited for when she gets to be four or five years old and I can start showing her all my little experiments and all the plants I got growing and teaching her about the cycle of life and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's something I'm looking forward to. Is she on a float bed? Well, I grow using aquaponics. Yeah. So she's on a bed that's supported by the edges okay. of the float bed. And, and you know, uh, I have a greenhouse in my backyard where I, I grow fish and plants and I grow a bunch of other stuff. And my yard is just full of kids every day after work. I come home from work and there's a, just a bunch of kids that want to see what's going on. And, uh, and that's really fun when you get to know your neighbors and they want to see. Um, <laughs> my mom and dad split up a number of years ago and, and, and my mom was going to therapy for a while because it was pretty stressful. And, uh, and we went, I went with her one time and we went to... Um, talk to the therapist after the session. And, uh, and this was about this time of year. And he, um, and he said, you know, I'm doing pretty well, but I'm extremely busy right now. I got appointments from when I wake up in the morning till when I go to bed. And we were like, well, why? What, what's the, the big deal? Are you like Mr. You know, famous Therapist or something? And he's like, no, it's February. People are losing it, right? It's Cabin <laughs> Fever Month. This is when I make my money. <laughs> If you got any therapist friends, ask them about that. Ask them about cabin fever month. <clears throat> so you want to save some money and not stop going to the therapist during cabin fever month. You know, you probably come up with all kind of ideas of what's wrong. You know, my marriage is terrible. You know, I hate my job, whatever. You really just need some sunlight. <laughs> you need to get outside. And a greenhouse can help with that. Uh, and this is what I do. This is my greenhouse. It's not a passive solar greenhouse, but it's got certain passive solar elements to it, and I grow aquaponics in there. If I had a passive solar greenhouse, aquaponics would be a lot easier. But when you've got a space that's warm, um, it's, uh, it's fun to play with stuff like that. You grow a lot of food that way, so that's my plug. <clears throat> How does it work? Um, this is a greenhouse that you saw a picture of earlier. It's designed by a company called Sarah's Greenhouses out of Colorado. They're sort of a, um, they're nice people. So when you put up a greenhouse, which way does the greenhouse face? South. South. Good. <clears throat> in the summer, where does the sun go? Where's the sun in the middle of the day in summer? It's high, high up in the sky, right? They call it high noon, right? That's sort of a misnomer in the winter, because where's the sun in the winter? Low. Low. <laughs> high noon. Low noon. <laughs> so in the winter, your sun is low, right? And it's coming, you know, mostly horizontal. And so in the winter, you, if you want to store sunlight as stored thermal energy, you put up something vertical, something, uh, yeah, vertical. So the sun will hit it vertically, you know, like this wall. <clears throat> but then in the summer, when the sun's high in the sky, you just put up a little awning, right? So the sun comes down and doesn't hit this thermal storage device. <clears throat> and so that's the basic concept of a passive solar greenhouse, is you provide something that can store thermal energy that the sun is only going to hit in the winter, and it's not going to hit in the summer. Because if you're storing thermal energy in the summer, you better be growing something that likes it at 250 degrees, because that's what you're going to get. 
Um, and this is this is a diagram about ecosystems design. They're a company that designs pretty large passive solar greenhouses, also in Colorado. So where are you going to store your sunlight, right? Where are you going to store it? Here's an idea that these guys named Penn and Cord out in Colorado, of course, came up with, which is um, black metal barrels full of water, right? And so, you know, you, how much, anybody know where you can get black metal barrels around here? How much do they go for? 20 bucks. 10 bucks. 20 bucks. 10 bucks. It's pretty good, right? So they got what, like about 150 of them here times 10 bucks. That's not that much money compared to the cost of a big greenhouse like this. 1,500 bucks for solar thermal mass, that's pretty good. Each one of these barrels contains 55 gallons of water, 55 gallons of water, about seven and a half pounds each, about 350 pounds of water per metal barrel. Each metal barrel, um, or each pound of water for each degree um, that it drops in temperature has to release one British thermal unit of energy. You don't have to remember all this, I'm just impressing you with them now. <laughs> so you've got 350 BTUs per barrel, <clears throat> per degree, and so let's say you warm up these barrels 20 degrees over the course of a day. And let's say you have 10 of them. That's 3,500 BTUs per degree, and it drops 20 degrees, right? So that's 70,000 BTUs that you have to release over the course of your night. That's a good-sized furnace. There's a lot of thermal storage capacity here. <clears throat> so that's something you can start the thermal energy in. Black paint and mineral barrels. What do you gain by having black? black uh, you know what happens like in the summer when you wear a black t-shirt? It's kind of the same thing. Black absorbs better. Yeah. White reflects, black absorbs. So, so to put that in practical terms, a greenhouse like that with all of that thermal mass, how, how warm can that stay at night, say tonight, when it's zero? Depends how warm it is during the day and how sunny it was during the day. <coughs> the thing to know about water is for, to drop one degree, takes one BTU to drop from 33 degrees to 32 degrees for the water to freeze takes 270 BTUs per pound, right? So generally what happens in the winter is you'll have, it, like if it's really cold, you know, like it is this weekend, your water will start to freeze at night. And it won't drop below 32 until it's entirely frozen, which is very unlikely to happen because the math of 350 you know, 3,500 gallons times 270 BTUs per pound, that's just not going to happen. That's an incredible amount of heat loss that you would have to achieve. Maybe if you were in Antarctica and you didn't see the sun for a number of months, but it's unlikely that these are going to freeze unless you have a lot of really cloudy days and really cold nights in a row. And so what's likely to happen is that these are going to remain at 32, right? And so the air in the rest of your greenhouse is going to be able to get a little bit lower than 32. But it won't get a lot lower than 32 because there's all of this surface area that's at 32. And so your greenhouse might drop to 20. And so what that's, that's in these kind of situations in really cold climates like ours and north of here, that's what ends up happening is these stay at 32, they melt in the daytime, and they start to freeze at night. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? I like, you guys are great. I really like all the questions. <laughs> What happens when you get a winter like last year where you have four days without sunlight? Uh, same thing. You, 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 you end up, I mean, you, you end up, at, you can do the math. Like, the math is not complicated. You know, the BTUs of loss. It's a little bit hard to model a greenhouse and figure out how much energy you're going to lose through the windows. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty easy to over design. And if you're really worried about a period when it's going to get really cold, I'm guessing you're not going to, maybe you are. Maybe some of you are going to build big, huge, honking greenhouses like this one. That's not huge commercially, but, you know, you could feed your family and half a dozen others with a greenhouse that size of the plants that you're going to grow in your greenhouse. Um, and so then if you're, if you're worried about a situation where you have a short period of time where it gets really cold and really dark for a while, um, then you start doing some of the stuff we'll talk about later in the talk, like shutters. You insulate the glass during that really cold period. Um, and insulating every night and then pulling it off every night is a hassle. I mean, that's just a hassle. But if you've just got a short period where it's going to get really cold, you have a night where you know it's going to hit minus 20, well, then you insulate that night. You know, and then the next day, if it's going to get a little warmer, then you take off your insulation and you leave it be. Is an application like that um, satisfactory? Can that be used in a smaller greenhouse, like a 20-foot greenhouse? 
Oh and yeah, it's even easier to do in a smaller greenhouse. And you have enough mass there? Well, it's just a ratio. Okay. You know, so this is a bigger greenhouse. You have more barrels. A smaller greenhouse, you have fewer. <coughs> And there's some other stuff you can use, like, like the Chinese-style greenhouses typically use concrete. This is actually in Manitoba. This is a, a PhD researcher in Manitoba, um, which, you know, believe it or not, like most people, when I tell them I'm from Wisconsin, they think we've got polar bears and stuff. There actually are places further north than us where it gets colder and they get less sun. And one of those places is called Manitoba. <laughs> and so there's this researcher who did a bunch of ideas. So this is a Chinese-style greenhouse. He's a Chinese-style guy. <laughs> and, uh, and the basics is you have a, a layer of concrete at the back wall, which is your thermal mass. So thermal mass means like it's able to store heat. It's, you know, and thermal, things that have thermal mass are generally really heavy, right? So like concrete is very heavy, and so it's able to store a lot of heat. Um, you know, metal is generally pretty light. Plastic is very light. Plastic and metal can't store much heat. So you want something heavy. You know, water is heavy, but additionally, it freezes at a temperature at which you're likely to encounter. So that freezing gives you additional ability to store heat, which is also called thermal mass. So yeah, you put concrete at the back of this greenhouse. You insulate the back of that concrete with straw bales or something else. They typically use straw bales in China, but you can use foam board insulation, like the pink or the blue stuff, in ours or Home Depot or whatever. Um, in Manitoba, uh, they found that they can usefully use about six inches of solid poured concrete that that's enough to store as much thermal energy as they get. We could probably use more because we get more sunlight than Manitoba does. So we have more thermal energy that we can store. So, so you have this greenhouse and generally they use cheap poly cover over the top and they have the awning there like you see. Um, and then they store their energy in the concrete and then that thermal energy radiates over the course of the night. Um, and the typical thing that they do in Chinese style greenhouses, which you'll see later, is they roll a blanket over this on really cold nights, just like I described. And they usually use straw blankets. You could use a pool cover or you could use, you know, something you make yourself out of tarps with um, fiberglass inside or, you know, you could be creative. I'm trying to get my wife a, a seamstress. I'm trying to get so many a big 30 foot by 30 foot blanket. As far as I can see to do it. She doesn't think you're selling she can handle it. <laughs> but you see these everywhere in China. These are like very common. And this is how they grow without using any energy. This is called a wallapini, right? Thermal mass is stored in what? The ground, right? Yeah, you, I mean, last year we had our frost level was about five feet in this area. Might have been a little bit more. You know, this is about five feet down. And so you go five feet down, you're getting below the frost line. And so you're able to take advantage of some of that natural. Um, you know, the ground is just naturally warmer than the air above it. Um, and so you're storing thermal mass in the earth. And this is a pretty easy greenhouse to build if you have, like, you know, an army of slaves or a backhoe or something. <laughs> <laughs> or if you happen to encounter a rectangle shaped pit on a piece of wood, there you go. <laughs> This is an interesting type of building. Anybody know what this is? Have you ever seen a building like this? Rammed Earth ship. Rammed Earth. I heard Earth ship. Yeah, this is an Earth ship. These are popular in New Mexico and Nevada. Um, these are passive solar buildings. They're very much like a passive solar greenhouse. Basically, the whole front is windows, right? So the sun's light comes in all day long, and the thing, the whole thing is made out of earth, right? And, and concrete. And they use all kind of crazy materials like tires and stuff. So basically, you're just storing all of that sunlight, beaming in there all day long, all winter long, and then at night, it just releases. <clears throat> and generally, the back wall of Earth ship is, um, you know, straw bales or insulation, you know, up against Earth. And so it's pretty well insulated, and the roof is pretty well insulated. So Earth ships are buildings that are not up to code in this part of the country. They're starting to move this direction, but they're very popular out west, and you basically don't have to heat them for the same reasons. And there's, there's some kind of mythology or whatever. This guy who designed Earth ships, I think he had something about the Earth was a ship and you had to be able to drive. I don't know, I don't know exactly what it was. The people that promote Earth ships kind of downplay that, but I'm really, I don't know. If I was the sort of person who looked stuff up on the internet, I'd really know, like to know what that guy was about. Uh, and you can store solar thermal energy over time, right? So I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but this is... This building incorporates something called a subterranean cooling and heating system, right? It sounds very, like, futuristic, but it's a way of storing 
the solar thermal energy from the summer so you can use it in the winter. Right? So you basically create a, a layer underneath your greenhouse, many feet thick, you know, millions of pounds that you're storing energy in all summer long that is much warmer than it would be otherwise. So then in winter, you can pull some of that energy out. So that's where you can store some energy. And then once you've got your energy stored, you need to insulate it, right? You need to protect it. So south wall, greenhouse is face south. North wall, there's no sun up there, right? You don't need any sunlight coming from this direction. So you just insulate this really well. You can do it with straw bales. You can do it with foam board from the hardware store. You can do it with the earth, like if this was a hill, right? If you're on the side of a hill and you chopped into your hill and the hill comes up here, you can use the earth both as solar th thermal storage and as insulation. Um, you saw that blanket, right? There's a, there's a Chinese dog in your house. You can roll a blanket across. <clears throat> and so once you've got that solar energy stored, you've got to insulate, protect it, keep it there. It's your baby. So, how much does it cost? Well, it depends what you do. This greenhouse costs about $45,000. I'd like to have one of these. I'm not going to pay $45,000. I don't have $45,000. Anybody wants to loan me $45,000, I don't know if I can pay it back. This is a really fancy greenhouse built by these guys called Synergistic. And these, these greenhouses actually will stay at more like 60 or 70 degrees all winter long. It's a really pretty impressive design. They use really, you know, multiple layers of really fancy glass. Motorized shutters. Is yeah. that temperature in our area? Uh, this is northern Colorado, northern Colorado. So they wouldn't, it's a little bit easier there. But, you know, at elevation, they get worse. You know, sometimes worse temperatures than us when you get up at 10, 12,000 feet where some of the people live who build these things. That's expensive. Unless you're living in it. Well, yeah, if that's your house. Yeah, if that's your house, then it's kind of a bad house. What is the name of the product that we're looking at? The sheets? This here? Yes. Uh, I think that's acrylic. Okay. This looks like acrylic to me. Uh, more commonly these days, so for a long time people used acrylic, because acrylic is harder to work with than the other type of plastic used for greenhouses houses was called polycarbonate. But for a long time acrylic was far better at not turning yellow mm -hmm. over time. Acrylic would last for 20 years before it starts to turn yellow. Polycarbonate over the years would last 5 to 10 years, or even less sometimes. They're starting to get polycarbonate products. Polycarbonate's easier to work with because you can bend it a little bit. Acrylic is very rigid. If you try to bend it, it will break. Um, but polycarbonate, they're starting to figure out how to get it so it'll extend to have a longer life so it's yellow. So I used to tell everybody you only use acrylic, but nowadays I think polycarbonate is getting it. Um, so this is less than $42,000. <laughs> Right, these sheets, these acrylic sheets, you know, if you use polycarbonate, you can get sheets like that for about $100 or less. Sometimes you can get them for $40 or $50, depending on whether you get them used or new or where you get them or you get them in bulk. Um, you know, straw bales, if you're a farmer, you can get those for nothing. If you know a farmer, you can get them for not much. You know, it goes up against the shed. You know, you got the stucco shed here, right? Stucco is concrete, right? You know, so you got some thermal storage there. Greenhouse like this, a few hundred bucks. You That's can bad. get the actual, not the polycarbonate, but you can get the, what's called a solar relax two-ply sheet, four by eight, runs you about $48 a piece. Oh, wow. And so is that S-O-L-E-X-X? -X? Yeah. It's, the, it's a product, Solar Relax. Mm -hmm. Actually, surprisingly enough, now uh, you can actually go and pick them up at Menards. Menards oh, wow. handles it, mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. I did a... I had a portable greenhouse, one of the plastic ones, kits, and I decided to, because the plastic had torn and so forth over the years, and so I just really just retrofitted it with the with the solar like plant panels, and they and the nice thing about them is because the it was kind of a dome shaped a greenhouse, one of those, pot, those kits that you can get, and so the solar like panels you can actually. Bend and, and so forth, and so it would bend to the curve. And then I just, and then basically all I did was to uh, to fasten it to the metal paneling. Is all I did was put it in it, use sheet metal screws through the through the thing, drilled drilled a hole through it, put the sheet metal screws, worked perfect, sealed and sealed the edges with uh, silicone. 
the brand name for that is S O L E X X. Um, I'm actually really interested to hear that they're selling them cheaper now. They, historically, they were pretty expensive. But it was at one time expensive, it yeah. have, but I was surprised to find find the fact that actually not in a place like Menards is selling. Size of the panels? They were they were the bigger size that you would get four by eight. Four by eight. Okay. Four by eight sheets. Okay. Oh, that's actually new too. They did. And how much? For years they were just selling. I, they sheets were. They were I think they were. Kind of I think they were about forty-eight dollars pounds, something like that. Thank you. I'll answer that one. <laughs> I think that might actually be more than forty-two thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. I know the guy that built that. If you want to. That's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. This is out in uh, Cross Plains, I think. This is uh, not a passive slope thing house, but it's a nice picture. <laughs> So if you want to pass a sold a greenhouse, right? Yeah. And you got a good paying job. You can hire somebody to do it. Um, you know, those first four companies are out in Colorado, but they make plans, right? Like architectural plans that a builder could follow, or if you know how to build, you could follow. You know, and you might convince them to sell you a set of plans that you can build. <laughs> um, and they all build fantastic greenhouses. Uh, you know, if you're looking for somebody to build one, um, there's a fellow named Jordan who works at the Madison Greenhouse Store, who's a really nice guy. And, and you know, obviously, as you can tell here, has very good aesthetic taste. So if you want a nice greenhouse, you can ask him or you can give him a design and he'll be able to work with you on what you want. Um, so you can pay somebody to build a greenhouse for you and that's an awesome way to do it. And you can feel confident that it was built, right? Especially if it was built by somebody that knows how to do passive solar greenhouses. The concrete floor would not be a thermal mass? Sure, it would. Um, but it depends what you want to use it for. Like, if you were going to use this to grow plants, right, you know, then concrete floor would... Well, yeah, so he's just growing plants in this, this little circle here. So it's more of a decorative thing the plants are than trying to really grow production. Okay. Yeah, so in a production greenhouse, you're not going to have a lot of space on the floor. Okay. That's not in use. You could. Or you do it yourself. This is me and my friend Laura. My crappy hundred dollar Craigslist greenhouse. But um, I really actually want to build this other greenhouse and just wait and save up money and convince my wife to spend it on that. But <laughs> <laughs> your crappy hundred dollar greenhouse does do what you need it to do. It's not a matter of money. It's it's a matter of taste and what you're willing to spend. Oh yeah, I mean it's an eyesore and it's got holes in it. But I mean, I grew up using aquaponics, and, and I um, have this whole philosophy about aquaponics where I insulate my aquaponics system. Right? I have a crappy greenhouse, but my aquaponics system itself, aquaponics is we raise fish and plants together. My aquaponics system itself is very well insulated and air sealed. So I put that inside of a crappy greenhouse, and I'm still doing pretty good. If I put that inside of a passive solar greenhouse, then I'm doing great. So you can do it yourself. I mean, especially if you're not especially concerned about aesthetics and you're not afraid of making mistakes. It's a pretty fun project, you know, to play with. Especially if you're retired and you got some time or you like to tinker and you don't sleep well. <laughs> uh, if you want to do it yourself, it's good to start with reading books. Just like any new thing that you don't know much about, it's good to start reading about it. <clears throat> a couple good books, these are two of them. Bio Shelter Market Garden, it's one of the books put out by Mother Earth News, a guy named Daryl Fry. Spent a lot of years growing uh, for uh, Market garden, you know, sell at the, you know, like he lives out in Pennsylvania, but you know they sell at his farmers market. And he grows all winter long. Um, this is a cool book. It's the guy who wrote it. It's a little quirky, but he's got a real neat greenhouse designs that her sheltered solar greenhouse book. There's a couple others, but these are as good a place to start as any. Make a plan. If you're going to build something like this, that you're going to put some investment in, it's got some complicated parts to it, and has a little bit of thermodynamics to it. Good idea to draw it all up and show it to somebody that knows a little bit about something like that. Show it to a contractor friend of yours. If you got engineer friends, show it to somebody like that. And when you find me at an event, you can show me your plan. There's so actually a good. very neat plan if you want a small greenhouse. Uh, I, think it, I think the website is Snapple using uh, PVC connectors, plastic poly, polyurethane connectors. PVC connectors, very very easy to to build the greenhouse with them, and then of course you use your 
your plastic and so forth. If somebody, now it wouldn't necessarily give you one for year round, but if you want a greenhouse for early starting your plants and extending your season in the fall, and uh, you can, I think it's, if you look at a Mother Earth magazine, they have an ad in there, but, but it's, I think, I think the product is snap-ons, and you can download their, go to their website and download their plans, and the plans are very complete. And an easy way to start out if you want a small greenhouse, that you probably could, I would say, build it probably inexpensively, because uh, all you're doing is, is piping. And if you go to a place like the Restores and so forth, Habitat for Restores, they usually have a lot of the, the PVC piping at a very discounted good price. Yeah. So you could put one together fairly reasonably. There's a, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. You start Googling passive solar greenhouse, you get pages and pages. You can start a little Pinterest album and put all your pictures. Mm -hmm. Passive solar greenhouse is up there. And all your friends can pin you, and, and that's a fun thing. And then once you're ready to build, you have certain stages to it. I'm not going to go through all these, but you got a foundation framing, glazing, which means your glass or your plastic, you know, flexible or hard plastic. You need venting, right? Because if you've got a greenhouse that stores heat really well, like it's going to get hot in the summer. You know, I, when I first built my greenhouse, I showed you a picture of it. It's not a very nice greenhouse, but you remember that year, two years ago, we got 80 degrees in March, mm -hmm. right? So I built it right before then. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have any venting in there, and I had all my peppers and tomatoes and stuff in there, <laughs> and everything just baked. It hit 155 degrees. Wow. Um, and it was interesting, two plants, there was two plants that, that didn't just seem to be not bothered by it, but seemed to love it. So like my hot peppers, the leaves had this like extra special sheen. They almost looked happy. <laughs> they were like, oh yeah, this is where I was born to be. <laughs> and my basil was actually was like completely happy with 155 temperature. So you can keep your greenhouse at 155 as long as you don't grow hot peppers and basil. <laughs> Have some interesting meals. <laughs> Make your friends over for oh, my hot peppers and basil again, Dad. <laughs> Uh, you need to plan your thermal mass, that's generally a, you know, because thermal mass tends to be so heavy, that tends to be something that you need to think about, and you need to decide, well, you know, what kind of back do I have? What kind of machines do I need? Do I need to hire some young people to come help with strong backs? Does the sun have to hit the thermal mass? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yep, it has to hit the thermal mass. There's no way around it. Is, um, <coughs> is stone the concrete? Uh, more effective thermal mass than water? Uh, foot. No, water's better. Oh, water's better. Yep. Okay. Those plants you mentioned, they're generally more susceptible to the cooler climate. Did that make them two plants in that basil you said? Right? Did that make it taste different? Or it <laughs> so this was March. Yeah. <laughs> and so by the time I was finally eating it, it was like June or July. I, I don't recall. That's a good question. You could probably call some people in Arizona and find out. Okay. For the thermal mass, if you had the concrete in back, would you benefit by having it painted black? Would you, you would more? You would benefit from that. Yeah. You can, you can actually uh, add uh, dyes to concrete, so the concrete mm -hmm. itself will be black. That way you don't have to worry about peeling over time or whatever. Although there's there's some pretty good paints now that will stick to concrete. You know, you can stain concrete now just like you stain wood. Paint actually paints have come a long way in the last few years. There's some really fantastic painting products that you can that you can buy now that stick to things that never would have before. And so then yeah, once you get it all built, then you can plant it. Here's some tricks. <clears throat> Subterranean cooling and heating system, compost heater, cold sink, shutter. Is Drew Carlson here? You're here? Okay, I'm going to make you talk. <laughs> and then you can do aquaponics. So subterranean building and heating system. This is the store of the energy in the summer, release it in the winter, right? This is cool. Um, and it's pretty simple in concept. So basically you have uh, pipes high up in the air on one part of your greenhouse, and then you have pipes low up in the air on the other part of your greenhouse, and those pipes run underground and connect to each other, and you run the air through a fan. You need these pipes to be like French, gosh, that light is bright. French drain style pipes so the water can drain out of them. And what, here's what happens, here's how it works. So uh, your hot air comes in here, 
and it warms up the soil, right? The soil's colder than the air generally, especially on a hot day or in summer. And so you warm up the soil a little bit, and then the air comes out cooler. Ta-da! <clears throat> but the real magic of this is condensation. So because, the, because your greenhouse is usually humid, because you've got plants transpiring water up into the air, that water you know, is, is evaporated in the air, and then it hits this nice cold surface down here, and it condenses. And water that condenses releases 970 BTUs per pound. And so when that water's condensing, it's releasing a lot of heat to this underground area here. And so you, by virtue of, of moving warm, humid air underground and releasing it as cooler, drier air on the other side, you are storing a rather incredible amount of heat in the ground. And then you want to insulate that ground so that heat doesn't leak, right? So you need to dig a big, deep hole and put insulation vertically down there, right? So then you've got like millions of pounds of earth underneath your greenhouse that's absorbing energy all summer long and in hot days in the winter in the greenhouse. And then at night, you run, do the same thing. You run the fan, except now you've got cooler, drier air up here, and you've got warm space down here, so your air gets heated. Now these are actually, in practice, better at cooling than they are at heating. So in the summer, um, depending on conditions, you can get as much as a 30 or 40 degree te dif temperature difference between the air that comes in here and the air that leaves here. So you can actually cool your greenhouse below the outside temperatures if you want to do that. So it's very effective at cooling. In the summer, you can expect, if you do it according to typical design conditions, um, somewhere between a 15 and a 20 degree difference you know, between your cold air that's coming in and your warm air that's coming out. But it's still helpful for heating in the winter. So if you're going to be digging a big hole underneath your greenhouse like to put in a foundation, you know, then this is something you might as well do because it doesn't cost that much. But if you have to excavate and you weren't going to do it otherwise, it might be more than you want to do, but it's pretty cool. <clears throat> and so this is the picture you saw earlier. So they actually run some of their tubes through the grow beds here. So they heat up the soil. And another benefit of heating up your soil, right, is one of the limiting factors for plants being able to grow, especially tomatoes for some reason. They like to have warm roots. So one of the reasons that, like, you can't really grow much for tomatoes, like in May, even if you're willing to risk the frost in May, your tomatoes aren't going to do much, in most cases because your soil is just not warm enough. Your soil needs to be warm enough for your plants to grow. So what a lot of like market gardeners will do is they'll just like put black plastic or clear plastic over their market garden before they're ready to start planting. So it just warms up the soil so your plants are ready to go. So they keep their soil warm all winter long by running their tubes to their grow beds. And this is what it looks like when you're building <coughs> Pretty awesome to look at. The manifolds. This is um. Anybody? Any questions on subterranean cooling and heating systems before I move on? It's not a complicated thing. I mean, the thermodynamics of it is a little bit complicated, but building one is like dead simple. Just connect them together, blow air through them. That's it. So this, he's kind of an interesting guy. He was a he's a quirky guy. You know, he's like, so, so this picture here, he's like, you know, raking compost stuff in like white loafers and white <laughs> shorts. Yeah. And, and like all the women are pretending to look at the compost or whatever. <laughs> you notice it's all women too, there's like two guys back here. <laughs> I'm guessing he had some kind of an interesting following. You know, if you look up Jean Penn on the internet, J E A N P A I N, he's a French guy. There's all these pictures of him like gardening and doing this like big like wood. He's got this huge wood chipper and stuff, and he does it all in his speedo. <laughs> so lot of, like, this, this guy who invented all this stuff, he's like this big buff French dude, like inventing all these agricultural techniques, and he's, he does his work in his speedo. <laughs> gotta, love the, gotta love the French. Hey, can I go back a second yeah. to, to the subterranean and the heating system? Yeah. How far are those tubes underground typically? Oh, that's a great question. As deep as you can get them. So as, if you're going to dig a hole, put them at the bottom of the hole, yeah. right? If you can put them 40 feet underground, that's so much the better. But like, you're not going to because... Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually, there was a while when there was this company trying to promote nuclear power systems for people's houses. Right? Like for your neighborhood, you'd build a nuclear power plant. And basically what you do is you bury it 60 feet underground. So like no terrorist is going to steal it because you, 
and you'd notice. <laughs> Why are you digging 60 feet underground in my backyard? I, I don't think that idea went anywhere, but it was creative. And this is what it looks like when it's done, right? This is like 50 square meters of, uh, of wood chip compost, right? And compost over the course of the winter, right? So, so you could do this out of like regular compost, like chicken or, or, or plant waste, but the problem is, is that regular compost heats up really hot for a short time. You know, so if you did a huge pile of chicken manure, it gets to like 400 degrees for like a week. <laughs> and then you'd have to do it again. So you need something that's a slow burn. So when you do a big compost pile to heat something up, you usually use, you know, wood chips, especially like even like maybe large wood chips. And then you insulate the outside of that wood chip thing and you run pipes through it so that you can circulate water and that compost will provide heat over the course of winter. Now you need some machinery to do this because you're not going to shovel 50 yards of wood chips unless you got like, you know, a really severe case of ADD or something. Um, but if you got the machinery, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and this is what Drew built, right? So this is Drew. You mind coming up, Drew, and just saying a little bit about what you did? He called it a biomealer. Why in the heck did you call this thing a, what's a biomealer? It's a uh, German. It's the German. Oh, hang on, we gotta get you some cable. Yeah, so um, this, uh, this fall I decided to do something crazy and build a giant compost uh, heater for a CSA that my brother-in-law's brother owns, about half an hour north of the town, uh, or north of the city in a small town called Rio, where I grew up. So, um, you know, it was last minute, but we threw it together and we did a workshop where people um, paid to come out and help us build it and learn how to build it. Um, and it was a learning experience for us as well. And uh, we're still kind of working on some of the kinks um, uh, and I'm going to be heading out there next weekend to work on some more of it. But um, basic idea is um, you use a pile of wood chips. Um, we did about 90% uh, just uh, agricult or, uh, 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 arborist waste wood chips. We got all the wood chips for free. Um, we used about 180 cubic yards of wood chips. The pile, this is kind of half done, the pile. Now I think there's a, another photo possibly of the full one. So that's, that's just kind of halfway done. Um, Are but there in the, straw bales on the outside? Yes, yep, yep. And so the pile ended up being um, about 12 feet tall and about 20 feet wide. And it was basically like, kind of like a circle. Um, and it was about 90% wood chips and then about 10% uh, horse manure. And we insulated the outside with about, I think it ended up being um, 175 or 180 straw bales. <coughs> Help, uh, help kind of keep the moisture and the heat inside um, over the winter. Um, and so the basic idea is, if any of you are familiar with like a geothermal system, it's very similar to that, right? So we've got kind of two heat coils. We've got um, we've got a heat. Uh, what, what do you want to say? Uh, heat exchanger. So we've got heat exchangers in the compost pile <coughs> itself. And then we also have a heat exchanger um, that we're using as underbench heating in their uh, 30 foot by 60 foot uh, hoop house. And so the basic idea is you put down a layer of wood chips of the mix and you water it down really well because we want to get that moisture level correct and get some of that, uh, some of that activity of the fungal, fungal and uh, bacteria activity. And then we put in um, one of these layers, which is um, it's just polyethylene pipe we used about in, we used an inch and a quarter polyethylene pipe, and we zip tied it to a 16 foot long hog panel in order to get the nice spacing on the spiral. And so basically, the idea is you've got this pile, and ours we've got six of these heat coils stacked flat up through the pile. And so the water goes in, uh, goes into the first one, goes to the center, works its way out to the outside, and then it comes up and then goes to the next one, goes in the center, works its way up all the way out to the top, the sixth one which then it comes back down and then it sends out to the greenhouse. And so, um, as of about a month and a half ago, we were putting in 45 degree well, well water. I think that's around here, it's roughly about 45 degrees. And uh, we were getting temperatures um, coming out at 160, we topped out at. Um, so, uh, we're still working on some of the kinks. Um, we're really, 
this is not the hard, difficult part, you know, building that pile, throwing a bunch of wood chips, making, making sure the moisture level is right, laying in these levels. But, you know, probably looking in hindsight, probably would been good to bring on like a plumber or somebody that knows a lot about like, uh, you know, friction coefficients on piping and sizing of pumps and all that stuff, because that is very important in turning and making sure you can control the flow because that can, your control of the flow controls the heat output. So basically, we've got everything, you know, coming out of the pile, it's great. We've got good heat, um, but we're still working on some of the issues with the uh, underbench heating. You can also do it in a more simple way. If you've got a smaller greenhouse, you can have a big, like, 400 gallon tank that you can basically just pump and dump. So you, you know, pull the water out of that tank, send it through the compost heater back in and dump it into that tank and just keep it circulating. There are some people who uh, do it that way. We, I guess we decided to make it more difficult for ourselves. And so um, we decided to try doing underbench heating. Um, and I'm very happy that next, I'm very confident that next iteration of it is going to be even better. So um, we're working with some more people and getting them involved. And um, so far it's been really, really fun. And uh, it's been quite amazing to see the temperatures that come out of it. So, Josh? After the underbench heating, is it a closed system? Or is the water going back into the pile? Or are you yep. dumping it? Uh, so, so we initially wanted to try and make it a closed system, um, but what we end up doing now is we have a 40 gallon barrel that provides us um, uh, a place for the water, any air to escape that gets in the pipe and keeps good head pressure on the pump to keep the pump going. And so right now it goes out from the pile into the greenhouse through our underbench heating and then pumps and then gets dumped into the 40 gallon and then gets sent back out. So. What does underbench heating mean? Oh, say underbench heating is like, like say you have your bench with all of your pots on or your your plants, right? And so it's basically just like tubing. Sometimes it's uh, plastic piping. Sometimes they use aluminum with like little fins to help disperse the heat. But the idea is the the good thing about doing underbench heating is is you can um, you keep the root zone at a good temperature, and so it allow the, it allows the air in the greenhouse to be cooler. So you can usually sometimes get it like 10 to 15 degrees cooler that way while still keeping the plants alive because you're keeping the root zone as long as they have that good root zone warmth they're still happy so what are you hoping to get out of the life of your 12 by 20 mass yeah so our rough cal i mean obviously this is kind of a, a new area right and so there are some calculations that we looked at for germany and we did some rough estimates i i'm not i just don't want to take up too much of your time here Jeremiah too. So maybe after this question, if anybody wants to check in with me after um, Jeremiah is done, I'd be more than happy to answer more questions for you. I just don't want to take up too much of his time. Um, but we are shooting for roughly around 30,000 BTUs coming out of it. So um, about the size of the propane uh, heater that they have running. Now we're running some issues with like uh, heat emissivity of the piping and getting that heat, getting be able to pull that heat out um, from the pipes once they get into the greenhouse. But that's kind of the experimental phase that we're working on to get that going. So, um, yeah. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and you know, by the way, if you have like a little one yard by one yard by one yard compost pile in your backyard and you're thinking, hey, I could use that. Yeah. Like, no, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can do a little bit smaller, especially if you're using it for limited applications. Uh, you can see compost heaters in this plan. This is the BioShelter Market Garden. What he actually does is he blows air through his compost in pipes, and then he runs it underneath his grow beds to heat them up. So he's just warming soil a little bit. He's not trying to heat his whole greenhouse. And he actually does it by hand. I think he has a severe case of ADD. He does a lot of stuff. Like that. I don't think I could. Um, cold sink, real briefly. Everybody know what a heat sink is? In your computers, it's a way of drawing heat away. This is a way of drawing cold away, right? So if you put your plants not at the bottom of your greenhouse, but you've got a layer that's lower, the coldest air in the greenhouse goes down to this layer that's lower here, and it stays down there, and your plants are a little bit warmer than that. So that's something you can do. And then you've got a little aisle walkways. So if you've got a bad bag, you can work in your plants without bending over. And he actually, this guy who invented this, likes to put rabbits in his cold sink, because rabbits are like, one of the most cold tolerant animals on earth. I think they're only, the only practical animal you typically raise that's better, more cold tolerant than rabbits is ducks. How many plants? Time's up. A couple real brief things. Shutters, right? You can build a shutter like this, 
which during the daytime reflects energy into your greenhouse because limited amount of sun in the winter, right? So you get a little bit extra, especially if your roof is painted, the inside of your ceiling is painted white and you're reflecting sunlight back into it. And then you pull this fancy cable, this nice lady's gonna pull her cable and shut it up at night and then there's insulation everywhere. There's a diagram of how you might do it. This is one that's on the side of your house. So you've got one, um, you know, one panel up against your house that you lower at night and then one from the ground that you pull up. Right, so that's the problem. If you get a, a night when it was minus 27, you know, for several nights, like last year, it's like, hey, it's gonna be super cold, I'm just gonna shut up my greenhouse for a few days. Chinese style greenhouse in the blanket I mentioned earlier, you can motorize that. The one trouble we have with this sort of a thing in our climate is we get snow. So if you roll it out and it snows, you gotta get the snow off before you can roll it back. I don't think your wife's sewing machine's gonna Yeah, my wife's sewing machine probably won't. She can do a better sewing machine. This is my aquaponic system. Um, so yeah, I'm out of time. Um, I'd love to take more questions. I'm gonna be at the Madison Area Permaculture booth number 304 for like the rest of the night and I'll be there the rest of the weekend. So you got questions, you can find me there. Um, there's a sign up for my blog which is about aquaponics and solar thermal greenhouses. Um, and then I've got business cards if you wanna to talk to me again. Um, wow, what a great group. Thank you for all the awesome folks. They like to have evaluations, so if you have comments, you can write them down. Yeah. Um.